guys. Welcome to another episode of the Brooklyn Boxing Podcast. I'm here with Michael Elagide. Um, Pleasure to have you here. You have an amazing story as a professional fighter and, and of course, what you're doing today. So thanks for, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's a good time. Thanks so much, Pat. Awesome. Yeah. And um, just for, you know, the people listening and, and watching, um, you know, of course, your, your fight career was a long and successful one, but um, you have a great backstory as well that I wanted to touch on. And um, I know you were born in Liverpool, correct? That's right. Liverpool, England. And uh, so how, how, how much time did you have in, in Liverpool before you, you moved, I know, to Vancouver originally? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I was born in Liverpool, England, and I was raised there until I was about seven, eight years of age. And then um, my father, my mother, and my brothers and sisters, we came out to Vancouver, Canada. And uh, that's where I, I stayed until I got the call from the garden. <laughs> and talk about that. I know that was a huge, a huge call, right? Yeah, no, it was. Um, so, so what happened at first... Um, I had fought, I had made some, I'd been making some waves because uh, Michael Spinks actually fought Oscar River De Niro. I think it was like 1984 or 85, 84 in Vancouver, Canada. He defended the world title there. And, um, and he won by knockout and I fought the semi main event on his card. And on his card, um, I fought this, one of his sparring partners, a real tough guy. And, and it was a crazy fight, a good fight. I ended up winning it, of course, but, um, cause I was <laughs> undefeated through most of my, through all my career in Canada. And then um, I got a call from Russell Peltz in Atlantic City, and they wanted me to fight Curtis Parker on their Tiger Ride promotions. I think that was Sylvester Stallone's boxing promotion or something. And so they asked me to come out and fight Curtis Parker. I think at that point he was ranked about number 10 in the world, 11. And uh, I came out there, I fought him. It was a great fight, had a great time. I'd never fought on the East Coast before, and uh, I won that fight. And at that point... So the East Coast was hearing about me at that point. And uh, that's when Matt Square Garden started to... I fought James Hardrock Green, another middleweight contender. And that's when Matt Square Garden started to be like, oh, okay. And they started to bring me back more, and I fought for the Garden for a while. And uh, and then it just progressed from there. I ended up asking me to come and stay. I had met some um, managers, uh, Stan Hoffman, for one. Um, and they asked me to come out and... and just established my career here and the garden signed me to a contract and it was beautiful. It was a great time. Yeah, man. I mean, that must have been, you know, an amazing call to get, get that call from the garden, but to kind of like rewind, yeah. uh, I know your nickname was silk, right? For your boxing uh, skill and, and your footwork. And yeah. I know Ali was a guy that, you know, you really looked up to growing up and you, a, a guy you tried to emulate. Yes. So I was kind of thinking, um, you know, did that come, did those skills really build during your amateur career? Or what did your amateur career look like before, you know, you really made it and you really got that big signing? You know, my, um, my amateur career was very, very, it was very short. It was very abbreviated. I started late as an as a amateur boxer. And I started, so I started when I was about almost 16 years of age, which as an as a amateur fighter, you really want to get started when you're, when you're younger than that, maybe in the single digits, 8, 9, 10. You want to get used to being in the gym, 11, 12. You're starting to you know, spar with people and take punches. And the reason why for that is because you get, you get used to punches coming at you. You have to see a high number of volume of punches coming at you before there's some normalcy in it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. that human condition. You'll adapt to it. But it's a matter of first you have to have seen a lot to it, a lot of it. And then you're able to slip punches and not panic over punches. But when you start later, like for instance, I started at 15, 16, and you're sparring guys, and and you're and I was very like uh, physically I wasn't mature when I was 16. I didn't get mature like physically mature, putting on real muscle till I was about 20, 21. I was a late bloomer. These guys that were <laughs> these guys I was sparring with, they were like by age 15, 16, 17, but they were like men, they were fully developed. And when you're fighting them, they're hitting you and they're hitting you like with manpower. And I still felt like a kid. So I had to, I tried to adapt and like, it causes you quickly to have a sink or swim, you know what I mean? So I, I learned defense as best as I could and I learned to jab and I learned to move a lot. But interesting enough, my nickname was Silk, but my first nickname was Master Blaster. 
And I, and I used to love that name because it would, I mean, it made me have to go out in there and prove something. So everything I came out there, I came out there to hit hard and, 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 to, and to knock people out and to give an exciting fight. That's how I fought initially. And then, um, and then um, my dad said, you know, I think Silk would probably be a better name for you like this. And I was kind of like, it was hard letting it go, but it made sense to me after a while. Because then I started to, even though I was always into Ali, I started to, I watched him more. And I watched his reflexes and the way he was able to measure his opponents and, and hit them without getting hit. The, you know, in his Cassius Clay years, early Muhammad Ali, that. And um, yeah, so that's that was my that was my inspiration. And... Um, and, and amateur boxing was a very short period of time for me as well. I, I fought amateur for about a year, year and a half, but I fought some really good fighters. Some guys that are like, I fought Greg Hogan, who was one of the, he ended up being lightweight champion of the world, but I fought him in my fifth fight and he had already been like an amateur champ and everything. So I lost the decision, but it was a good fight. You know, so I, I, I fought some good guys as an amateur. Yeah, and you said your dad was your really your trainer or who, or who pushed you into boxing? I know you worked with some some really like notable trainers of Dundee and Gotti, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, my father was an uh, ex-professional fighter as well. Okay. So um, so he had fought and he Over had- Over England or in- I'm sorry, in England, yes. So for in Nigeria and in England. Okay. He went by the name of Ola Michael. And, um, and so then when he came to Vancouver, he was working in the shipyards and he was uh, he was doing that kind of woodwork. And um, then he asked, uh, then, I don't know, I was, my mother and father were divorced. I ended up living with my mom. And I, at one point I was 15 years of age and I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do next. I love football, but I was too skinny for football. And um, <laughs> I just couldn't, I just couldn't cut it. There's no way I'd last. So, um, my sister told me, said, oh, dad's, a, you know, he's, you know, he's a boxer, of course, but he's got a gym now. You should go see him, blah, 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 blah. So um, against my mom's wishes, I went and I did that. I went, I went and seen him and we boxed and I liked it. There was just something about it I liked. And I've always loved boxing growing up, obviously from my father's influence, but from the fighters I saw on TV on the weekends, you know, you're growing up watching these like incredible athletes, uh, you know, Bobby Chacon and, and uh, you know Muhammad Ali, Marvin Hagler. You're looking at all these guys on TV, and you're like, "Yeah, I could." Do, you feel like you can do it, and um, and that's how I gave it a try. I went to my father's gym. My very first day, I stepped into the ring, and I, I sparred. Maybe after a week of stepping into the gym, and I fought this kid named Nelson Ali. In fact, and <laughs> I should have known from the last name. So the very first time we sparred, I get in the ring. And out of nowhere, he threw this overhand right and hit me on the head, and everything went black, like everything went black. And my and I remember my sister, I mean, everything was black, and I remember my sister screaming to this very day because she was there watching the sparring, and uh, <laughs> and that nightmare stuck with me after that. And I was like, I'm gonna get him back to that. It took me a year and a half, but I ended up getting him back. But he, he's he's really a great guy. But that punch was not didn't feel good. I remember it to this very day. <laughs> well, I'm sure. I'm sure. Once you became uh, silk, you know, you weren't you weren't looking to take ma too many punches like that with a fancy footwork. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Well, head movement was really important. If you want to stick around in boxing, if you want to be, um, if you want to be successful in the long term, it it, it is about hit and not getting hit. And um, and the more you're able to do that, the less uh, injury you could take. I think point and example um, is Floyd Mayweather. Every right. single fighter in professional boxing, I can't think of one fighter with the exception of maybe Marvin Hagler that hasn't suffered the the downside of boxing with the exception of Mayweather. Mayweather and Hagler, and I think Hagler because he's just so durable. Like, it's incredible. Like, I don't know, his cranium must be this thick or something. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen, he's, you know, reportedly never been dropped, never been rocked, all the rest of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and he's never in a, in a professional fight anyway, that's for sure. But um, he's never shown the, uh, the, the usual signs of someone that's been in a boxing career because football players, it's their knees. Uh, uh, you know, everyone's got whatever their sport is. They have an injury that, that tells you about what they did, their sport. Right. And boxers, it's usually brain injuries. 
and you know obviously there's scar tissue but it goes a little bit deeper than that it starts getting superficial so the brain injuries um the slurred speech the uh eye problems different things like that but floyd was able to dodge that because he i think one he was obviously a great fighter but he was very adept defensively and he, and he fought defense before offense and so when you're thinking a little bit more self-preservation it makes right. sense but even someone is great that were great defensive fighters like muhammad ali and and sugar ray leonard um, they have the ability to make you miss. Wilfredo well, Benitez was another incredibly great defensive fighter. And um, P. Sweet P yeah. was one of the best, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sweet P, uh, Pernell Whitaker was incredible. And um, uh, But uh, I don't know if he suffered any um, any injuries from boxing at the end of his career, but all the other guys, we all got it, you know? And it's um, you just you stick around too long. There's the wars in the gym, and then there's wars in the fight. Right. And, you know that it all adds up yeah yeah i mean there's a lot um, floyd's been very vocal about that like saying you know there's nothing cool about taking punishment and as oh. a fan as a fan you know the we love to see those wars and 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 those battles and and see these guys uh mm -hmm. push to the limit but you you can quickly forget what is really lost in that ring and and yes. um what fighters are really putting on the line every time they get in there that can be quickly forgotten. So it's as a professional fighter and as a guy in the ring, yeah. um, of course, you you know, you know don't want to be in a war and you want to hit and not be hit. And yes. that's really the name of the game. No, absolutely right. It's a fine line because, you know, um, some people who are not in the ring that paid good money to see your fight, they're looking at it as entertainment. The fight is looking at it as self-preservation and employment. Right. And so it's kind of like, am I going to entertain you or am I going to employ myself and stay employed for a while? And I think Floyd made that decision to stay employed for a while and it worked to his benefit. That's for sure. I mean, he's like a uh, hundred millionaire a few times probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he made people want, people wanted to see him get beat up, you know, with his, with his antics and everything. So it just added to the uh, appeal to tune in and watch. Absolutely. Yeah, he's unique. He's a unicorn. You know what I mean? Very few people could have done that. And he has the, he had the right temperament, the right personality, and the right skill set to do it. It's, you know, you have to have the reflexes and the, and the focus to be able to do that. And you also have to work extremely hard. What he did in the gym and with, you know, consistently, without fail, no matter what, he was always 100% prepared. And anyone who's going to beat him, they're going to have to bring their A game. Now, those guys, they weren't able to like step up to that level that needed yeah. to, they needed to get to, to beat them. And, you know, so more power to them. I understand that. Yeah. And he really adjusted too in terms of to relate it to your own career with your, your nicknames, yes. Master Blaster to Silk. Yes. <laughs> Floyd, it was really, um, you know, uh, Pretty Boy Floyd to Money May. And, and he, yeah. early in his career, he was really putting a beating on a lot of guys, but he had hand issues and really had to adjust his style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another interesting kind of component to it with the way he was able to really reform who he was as a fighter as well. Exactly. Yeah, no, being able to adapt, that's the, that is the most, one of the most important attributes that you can have when you're in the ring. Because you come in there with a plan when you fight, but it's what happens when the guy doesn't do what you think he's going to do. That's what determines whether you're going to win the fight or not. How quick you can shift up, how quick you can adapt to the moment. Now, somebody like um, like the great fighters were able to do it. Uh, you know, the the ones that um, the ones that didn't happen to get to greatness. Um, sometimes the talent issue, but oftentimes it's that inability to adapt. Sometimes it's even like the advice of your corner man. It's silly. It's crazy. It's like there's so many things. You think it's just one man against one man, but in a way, it's a team as well. And um, and sometimes you can place your trust in individuals when you really shouldn't, and you should listen to your own instinct. And sometimes you shouldn't listen to your instinct, and you should listen to your corner man. So <laughs> it's, you know, six of this half, a dozen of the other. Right. And, you know, as your career progressed, obviously, you know, you strung out a bunch of wins. Yes. Um, and then you had, of course, the, the eye injury um, mm -hmm. in that sparring session, I believe, right in Gleason's. I don't know if that was yes. in Brooklyn or at, at the time or if it was still in the Bronx as they moved uh, locations. Yeah, um, it, was, it was actually, um, the, the, they had the Bronx and then they went down to um, 7th Avenue and 33rd or 32nd, sorry, 32nd Street, 31st. 
um, Seventh Avenue, right down by the garden, and that's where um, that's when that that happened, and it was yeah. it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, extremely unfortunate. But the thing is, is when I look at your story and I see, okay, that happened in 80, 86, correct? Yes. And then I look and you, and you fought Iran Barkley, you fought Tommy Hearns for a title with basically one eye. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for people, you know, listening and, and watching that, um, to have an understanding of what that means is really, that's an incredible incredible feat that you were able to compete at such a high level with that mm -hmm. that inhibiting you i mean for to have that that inhibiting you in a in a fight in a boxing match that high level i mean I don't, i'm sure you could speak to it how you adapted um to overcome that you know um the first thing that happens when you have an injury that first you look at your situation and you know that if everybody knows who's supposed to know you're not going to be able to fight anymore. And so you did all this work to get up to this level. And now you're knocking at the door and you're getting closer. And it's not something you share because all of a sudden they're going to shut the doors on you. It's like, no, you can't fight anymore. You've got double vision or you're blind on one side, whatever it yeah. is. Um, so um, you have to find ways to get around the tests. And, you know, you do all that. And it just kind of, I know you try to, you try to carry your right hand a little bit higher to block from the hooks because... You know that's where most of my punches were coming from um that that would catch me and and with iran like for instance with tommy hearns when i fought tommy tommy is his his left hook's all right his jab is murder and his right hand is just it just decapitates you but it's coming from my left side so i'm able to pick it up a little bit more it's a little bit easier with with iran it was really difficult because he'd throw that looping hook and it was wide yeah. so so um i wouldn't catch it until it hit me <laughs> that's that's a little bit too late. He's pretty. He was a devastating fighter. He was devastating, devastating puncher and really strong. And that fight we had had a lot of emotion with it. It was emotionally charged. It's a fight that I had wanted for so long. It's a fight that he had wanted for so long. It was a natural and and um, and I I still you know there was there was a ceremony. Uh, we got inducted into the New York Boxing Hall of Fame uh, about a year ago, and. Um, Iran was there, and so was Arthur McConte, the referee who um, refereed that fight. And I don't know what happened to me, but all of a sudden I was like, I still can't understand why you stopped this fight. Yeah. <laughs> you stopped it. Too. I mean, this is what, 25, 1987? This is 88? This is like a long time ago. <laughs> I just can't let it go. I'm like, I still can't believe how you stopped that fight. This is, we were both knocked down. <laughs> and I was going on, but it was just madness. You know, it was, it was, it was entertaining. It was a great fight, though. Oh yeah, tremendous fight, and and yeah, I'd take your side on that one. Uh, you know, I was rewatching, and and um, he was he was hitting a lot of air towards the end. I gotta yeah. say. <laughs> so, and you know what? You know what the wild thing is? You get hit, and and he, he was, was swarming. Like, he was missing. He was swarming. He was missing, but my legs. I could feel my legs were kind of giving out, but I was moving back, and I saw him, and I saw everything so clear, and I was still moving my head, so it was hard for him to get a beat on me. And I saw the referee coming towards me, and there's this man in my head. I was like, "Don't do it, please, don't do it, please, don't do it." And I could tell he was coming in, and he was moving in. And I was like, "No, no, no!" And as soon as he grabbed him and turned him away, I just freaked out. I, all of a sudden, like everything came, everything was fresh, like this adrenaline burst that I wish had happened when he was throwing punches at me, happened just then when I realized that he had stopped the fight. Immediately, I, I was like, no, and he and he grabbed me and he was like, Michael, you can fight him or not, you can you can, you know, fight him again next time. I said, I don't want to fight him again next time. I'm fighting him now. <laughs> We're in now. That's the world. <laughs> yeah, and that's such a that's such a fine line as well. Like as we mentioned. Um, you know, even recently, like with the Deontay Wilder stoppage, um, different circumstance than your fight with, uh, Barkley, but debated in terms of whether it should have been stopped. And, yeah. um, you know, it's a very, it's a very fine line because it's, of course, the fighter is always going to want to continue. And, and th these guys are warriors and, yeah. and um, you know, they want to have control of their fate or their yeah. destiny in the ring. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, the ref is there to protect. So it's the a, ref it's there to protect the fighter. Absolutely right. Um, and, and sometimes, if the ref isn't um, an experienced, like an ex fighter, 
it's hard to relate to what this guy's going through. You know what I mean? So one way or the other, you'd you'd rather fail. Uh, you'd rather on the on the um, what do they say? Um, sort of like air on the edge of safety than on you know what I mean? Going too far. I, I completely understand that. Um, but at the same time, as a fighter, you've made your piece and you know exactly what it's about. You know what's up. And you go in there full well knowing the, you know, you can get an eye injury, you can get a blood clot in your brain. So many bad things can happen. Um, but it's the, it's the sport that we've chosen. And, it's, and uh, yeah, it sounds, it sounds crazy to anyone consciously thinking, you know, who've never done it before. Why would you die over it? But it's um it's your passion, it's your love, and you're willing. You, when you step in the ring, you, it could just be one punch from somebody, and you just never know. Right. Um, but the, with the Deontay Wilder fight, I, I saw it. I saw it differently. I thought, I th I kind of thought it was a good stoppage only because knowing, like Deontay's a very strong puncher, so you have to give him a puncher's chance. But knowing his abilities and his, he had limited skills, great power speed, all the rest of that, stamina, great heart, but skills that were going to allow him to get through that fight and win that fight, I didn't think so, because that Tyson was a different Tyson than last time. Yeah, no, and, I agree. Yeah, and, um, and, and Deontay, I don't think, he can only, he, from that fight, it appeared to me that he could only punch at range, at the range that's comfortable for him. He's not an infighter, and that's exactly what what um, Tyson's guy said to him, get on the inside, stay with this guy, work inside his range. Right. And, and, um, and, and that's when you need the experience to know how to roll with the punches and block and, and do little things like just turn the hand up and turn them over and you don't have to load up on everything. Just touch them up, touch them up and eventually you'll get your range. And, um, and that's not what he was able to do. So it didn't look like, I don't think he was gonna be able to turn that fight around. But it was it's still subjective and um, and it's tough. It's a hard it's a hard thing. If you had done it, that would have been amazing. And we all would have been shocked and you know and right. it would have been one of the great endings in heavyweight title fights if he could have turned around and won it, that's for sure. But it looked like like the when he got hit when he got caught in the corner and the way his body stiffened up, um, and the way Tyson was getting more he was getting more and more brave, he kind of established himself. And he's starting to really take it to him, sit down, not move on his punches, really plant his feet and punch. That was going to be a problem. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with, you know, your breakdown there. Um, Fury was a different guy in that ring that night than he was in their first matchup, 100%. I think the Kronk style that he implemented was um, really a genius game plan on, on his end. And mm -hmm. But physically, he was different. And, um, you know... I'm excited for the future of the heavyweight division. It's on fire right now. And, and the good thing is, is that the best are fighting the best. And, and that's really what all you can ask for, um, for, for a fan. Um, yeah. So that it's, it's great on, on that front. But um, yeah, I was also, you know, curious with, to kind of go back to, um, you know, not to harp on, on the injury, but when you were overcoming that, who was really aware outside of you and, you know, your team or people close to you, um, who was really aware of that and, and, and how were you hiding it? And what, what, what was that looking like at the time when you were going into these fights against Barkley and, and Hearns? And yeah. Um, it was funny. I, it'll, it'll, uh, I'll, I'll sum it all up at the very end, which was really the Hearns fight. Um, but when it happened, um, when it initially happened, I went to the New York Eye and Ear and uh, there's a, a couple of doctors that took care of me. One of them was Dr. Muldoon and the other one was Dr. De La Roca. And, um, and they initially said that it's not something I should be doing and I shouldn't be fighting anymore and that's it. And um, so at that point I knew I got to keep it really hush. My father knew, uh, I believe um, Bobby Goodman from the garden knew. Um, he's the head boxing promoter there. Um, yeah. And um, and I think that was about it, except for, you know, I had, I had a couple of trainers and obviously my sparring partners. I had a, another trainer, um, uh, Victor, Victor, um, oh man, it'll come back to me. I, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, but Victor, who was also in the corner, he ended up being, it's so insidious, this is crazy, but I was training for, for a fight and, um, 
I was training for the Barkley fight, and during the middle of that training, he had left my camp and had gone to Barkley's camp. Oh. And he'd been training with me for a couple of years, so he knew he knew me. Um, he knew my style and my whatever, which really didn't matter because fighting fighting Barkley was going to be fighting Barkley, and no one's going to when the bell rings, nothing else matters. Um, but I think he knew he knew about my eye and he knew of course from my habits in the gym all of a sudden like i used to fight like this and i used to walk around like this but once i had the once i started to get the, once i got the double vision and the blindness in the eye i had to fight i, I had to walk around like this with my chin down because i could only get single vision from here up from this part of my gaze up but from here down everything was double and so um it changed my fight style one i thought it helped because it would because uh, offensively it helped because it would help me keep my chin down. So defensively as well, I'd keep a chin down, you know, fight with your chin up. That's almost like rule number one in boxing. But where it hurt was throwing hooks, I couldn't pick them up in time and I couldn't lean away from them or get under them. I'd see two of them coming at the same time. So I wasn't smart enough to adapt. Like I didn't think about holding my right hand higher to the side of my head. I, I was used to fighting with my hand here and I just continued to do that. I, when you're in the middle of fighting and you're competing at that level, you're not thinking about your shortcomings. You're thinking about how you can best get to that guy. You're not thinking about, like I was thinking about what's coming at me. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do to him. And that was a mistake on my half. I should have been like, okay, acknowledge the injury, uh, acknowledge the shortcoming or, or this thing that I have now and, and, and adapt. But that didn't happen until a little bit later. And, well, it's uh, still, it's, I mean, to fight, I got to reiterate, I mean, to fight under those circumstances is really hard to fathom or even understand, um, you know, from my perspective as a fan, I'm sure other fighters, you know, listening to this or reading about your story and it's like to fight at that high of a level is hard enough as it is and to do it with limited vision is uh, really uh, on another <laughs> on another level. So it's like that as a whole, it's really hard for me to even grasp, honestly, like how, how that even took place or how you did it. And there's a similar story in the UFC with uh, Michael Bisping. I don't know if you were familiar with, with him, yeah. but he actually had, he revealed recently that um, he had multiple fights with a glass eye and he actually didn't, <laughs> People told him he had surgery on his eye to there. He had retina damage and um, people said, Oh, your eye looks, uh, it looks so much better. It's like, yeah. Oh yeah, the doctor did a great job. <laughs> and it was really, it was really a glass eye and he was fighting and he wasn't telling anyone somehow got past the doctors. Yeah. Like, so yeah. um, <laughs> another, a, a brother in arms for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Michael, great day too. I guess it only happens to Michael's. But how it all culminated um, was the Hearns fight. And um, there was a doctor, um, oh my Lord, he, he recently, uh, a while ago he had left us. He was uh, the Atlantic City, the Atlantic City Commission's doctor. He was a great man. I'm forgetting his name right now. Please forgive me. Um, there's probably slight brain damage as well. But um, we're going into the fight and he had the fighters come in. He had Hearns come in, looked at him, studied him, all of us, that kind of stuff, let him go. I came in, he gave me my medical exam and he, he was, you know, doing all the things you got to do, you know, testing everything out. Then he comes up to the eyes and he goes, he just looks at me and he goes, what happened to your eye, Michael, like this? And I was like, uh, well, what do you mean? And he goes, I know there's something wrong with your eye. What is wrong with your eye? What happened like this? And I was, um, and I was really hesitant and I spoke to him and um, and I was kind of like, please, you can't stop this fight. Like, this is, you know, it's the day, it's the, it's the day of and um, we're here and I trained really hard for it and, you know, just let it happen. I'm, I'm, it, it happened a couple of years ago and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to fight. And, and, and fortunately, he could have put the kibosh on it, but I think because it was a world title fight, it was turns. Media was there, press was there. It was just this whole thing, and I wasn't expected to win anyway. So, so I guess he was kind of like you know. But he was really caring, and he, and he wanted to stop it. But I begged him. I was just like, no, please do not, 
let this oh, fight go. Man, that's an amazing little backstory there. Oh man, it was crazy. It was mad. I thought for real <laughs> he was gonna pull a plug on it, and I was like, after all this, and um, yeah, he let it go on. So I was really, I was really thankful for that. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible, man. I mean, I'm in, I'm really in awe of that story, and and you obviously had a, a tremendous, tremendous career, and. Um, it didn't end there though. Then, you know, after your boxing career, I guess that kind of the theme for you is like adapt and overcome. Yes. And you said, you know, what's, what's next for me. And, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you started training some people out of a church. Yeah. 1991, something like that. Yeah. After the Just personal <laughs> training, boxing, fitness, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. So, um, so what happened? At that point, I was like, I'd retire. I'd stopped boxing. I couldn't fight anymore. I had a fight after that, and the eye was just shot. The doctors told me they were going to remove it. They had to remove it because it was just, it was just blown out completely. Um, so what, what I, what I had done then, I was like, okay, I can't box anymore. I have to come up with something. And then I started working with a doctor friend of mine. His name was Alessandro Pereno, and. Um, and he was a chiropractor, and, and then I was working with also um, another doctor who was with the New York Athletic Commission. His name was Dan, um, and, and uh, he, they were both working with people that were rehabbing with like lower extremity injuries, like knees and ankles and stuff like that. And they said, you know, maybe you can do a boxing workout with them. So I started doing that. And um, I did the boxing workout with them, and it was going really, really good. Um, and then... Uh, Gleason's called me up. I got a call from Gleason's and it was so great. Uh, Bruce Silverglade, he called me up and he said, Michael, there's this one lady who has a gym in lower Manhattan and she wants to um, have some boxers training people in her gym. And at that point, they were only doing like one-on-one -on -one workouts. So I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And when I got to her, her name was Leslie and it was down on um, lower Manhattan. I said, on Crosby Street, she had a place called Crosby Street Studios. And I said, yeah, I'd love to train some people for you, but I'd rather do like a group fitness class, like a whole bunch of people. It's like shadow boxing to music and jump rope and this, that, and the other. And she goes, okay, if you want to give it a try. Well, we pulled in some great people, uh, great numbers, and it, and it really took off really well. And um, people started writing up on it. And as it got into the post, like with Cindy Adams, and, you know, this is what an ex-professional boxer Michael Ajade is doing now. Equinox had just opened and they heard it and they said, could you come to Equinox and teach for us? And that was when they just had the one Equinox at the time on 76 <laughs> feet. And, um, and, uh, and so I went in there and I started teaching and classes were crazy. I mean, I had people like, um, oh man, um, t uh, Taylor, uh, what's his name? I seen fire and I seen rain. Great guy. Um, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. Well, I've seen that. I've seen the list of like the A-list like celebrities, the people oh, that you yeah, work with, yeah. like yeah. <laughs> everybody. It's you know, yeah. Palmer, Spike Lee, yeah. e, everybody. Adriana yeah. Lima. List yeah. goes on. Yeah, the list goes on. So it has some really great clientele, and and so it it caught on from there. That was really the first boxing for fitness class in at least in a in a gym in a non boxing gym um, for people that weren't boxers. That was the first, and we just built it from there, and then we built out the impact program. And then as I started to feel more comfortable and confident in the power of this thing, because uh, people hadn't, they, like boxing was for people that had boxed before generally, or people that were just you know into the thrill of it. But nobody had really experienced boxing to know what a boxer really goes through, not in terms of taking the punches, but the kind of effort and energy you have to put out and learning. It isn't boxing isn't just this primitive urge to punch somebody that makes you good. And that's what people had always thought. Right. But now that they got a taste of the fitness boxing and having to learn how to turn the punches over and how to, you know, uh, uh, the physical demands of it. And it's not a it's not a rage. It's not the rage at all. It's just home skill and ability. Um, they were able to appreciate it differently. I think it really brought something to uh, to the popularity of professional or competitive boxing as well. Because once people can taste it, like basketball, football, soccer, tennis, all those things are so popular because 
pretty much everyone can play it or at least throw the ball or you know you've played basketball as a kid nobody plays boxing as a kid or a family out a family out on a picnic is not going to have a boxing match together but they certainly could have a soccer match together or Right. football you know what i mean so you under you under you have that basic understanding about it but boxing they didn't but this all of a sudden allowed boxing to become mainstream like into everyone's house you're walking to someone's house And you could find a pair of boxing gloves sitting there in the corner. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, and I, and I really attribute that from fitness boxing, really. Otherwise, why else would they have them? It's something completely alien to people before fitness boxing became accepted as a, um, as a, as a real genuine and great way to get a workout. Yeah, I mean, you basically birthed like fitness boxing and, and what it is today. And, um, you know, obviously it's a huge trend and there's so many gyms, Rumble and, and Overthrow, and there's all types of, um, you know, fitness classes that are available, especially in New York. Um, and, you know, I have mixed feelings on um, the broad scope of it at times. And um, I kind of wanted to get your perspective on that as well. It's like, so for me uh, personally, like I, I love uh, fitness as in general. So I love working out. I love boxing as a workout. Um, I'm also, a, you know, of course, a, a fan of boxing, a, a fan of the sport. And, you know, I, I have sparred myself and will continue to. And I love, I love what it brings me as a perspective for someone who's on the media side. Um, Yes. going to be a professional fighter? No, but I, I love to put myself in the shoes and, and train for real. And, and it gives me a more of a perspective of what I'm watching. So Yes. I see some of these fitness classes, um, although I think it's great, you know, if you want to get in shape and use boxing, it's awesome. But Yeah. there, what's the balance of, um, you know, understanding, learning, learning uh, skills that really can apply in the ring and, and ones that are really for, for fitness. Yeah, well, I think I think basically I think people are. It's interesting. I think boxing is probably one of the most disrespected sports in that way. Like, I would never, if I were like if I, I don't know, let's say ballet was the number one fitness trend or whatever. I would never go to somebody who wasn't an expert in ballet or at least somebody who had done it competitively or. professionally, whatever it is, um, I would never go to them to learn ballet. And I wouldn't go to somebody who isn't a tennis player to learn tennis or a basketball player, someone who had vast basketball experience to do that. Yet with boxing, people can go to someone who just happens to be a fitness trainer, but doesn't know anything about boxing, probably never even put a glove on. And all of a sudden this guy's doing, you know, teaching this person how to box. And, it, and I think it kind of, The reason why I don't like it is for pretty much one reason. I think it makes it gives boxing for fitness a finite end because it's um, it gives it an end because it's as soon as you can't learn anymore. And in boxing, you can always learn. That's the thing. But as soon as you can't learn anymore, as soon as the music fades or as soon as the you know, they get tired of seeing the same lights doing the same thing, it's over. And that's unfortunate because boxing is one of the like one of the greatest forms of exercise we can do for ourselves because we can do exactly what a professional athlete can can do to get in shape for a fight with the exception of the sparring part the getting hit right so boxing has the kind of convenience you can do in your own house or your own apartment and you can get that level of workout without um without the expense and without you know it's without so many things that you need to do anything else but i, I think um i think it's going to come to an end really fast with the trend because It's just being mistreated by people who don't know how to teach the sport or do, do not, don't know how to teach the exercise. Um, you know, it, it's, become, it's become a fad instead of, like, it, it's, um, it is the Western Hemisphere's martial art. And it, it deserves that kind of respect, you know what I mean? And, and people who practice it, like Sugar Ray, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, James Tony, Roy Jones, all those great fighters. Those guys have honed that skill. Mayweather, all of them, every single fighter that's been in the ring and has gone up into the top 10 or world championship level, they've spent hours and years and countless punches and slipping punches. And, and to just 
you know, you have people coming out and they're just flinging and flailing, and and I understand the energy, and I understand the, uh, I understand the, um, the adrenaline rush you get from it, and I understand the, you know, you get sweat from it, but things you can get so much more, and that's the unfortunate thing about what's going on right now. You can get yeah. so much more out of this, you know, it's like, it like for for a city sport. It's the best thing you can do. I mean, in terms of getting fit, if you live in the country, you can get out and you can run, or you live outside the city, suburbs, you can get out, you can run, you can enjoy the outside. You live in the city, you're contained. So you can only take your workout to a certain level. But with boxing, you can take your workout to the upper echelon of your of your aerobic and uh, anaerobic capacities yeah. and do it safely. But it's also like this mind-body thing. It's I call it aggressive yoga. Uh, sorry, aggressive meditation. It's like you're you're. It's like you have the there's the focus, the mental part of it that you have to and and there's um, you have to execute a certain way and all those all those things give something back. But instead, people are just taking the superficial and they're running with it. They you know they have they have fancy lights and they have you know pounding music and everyone's woohooing and. They're dancing in between the rounds and all the rest of that kind of stuff, and I'm just like, wow. I, I kind of feel like, um, remember in Rocky when Sly Stallone comes into the ring, and he's in the ring, and all of a sudden Apollo Creed comes in, <laughs> and it's this parade, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, and they're jumping in, the and 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 Mick is like, what the hell? Right, <laughs> like, right. hell it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, for me, the way I kind of look at it, it's like. Um, I'm a fan of, of martial arts, right? MMA, whatever mm -hmm. uh, you want to say to encapsulate all of the different forms of combat. Boxing yeah. is my favorite one. Like yes. I, I, have, I have such respect for jujitsu and sambo and all taekwondo, kickboxing and Muay Thai, everything. I, I'm a fan, you know, I'm a fan of combat. And, and yeah. so many of these other disciplines have such a great respect that comes with them and a respect yes. for the craft and the art of it. And, and boxing is a martial art. And I feel like a lot of people forget that and they just treat it like a, like a game or a sport. And it's like, you would never go to, you know, a jujitsu class or anything like that. And it could never be created into some sort of, <laughs> it's like, why, why do it with boxing? You know, it's like, I, I, I have respect for people wanting to get fit and yeah. if you want to use boxing to get fit. That, that's awesome. But there should be a respect around, the yeah. fundamentals and what you're doing yeah 100 percent. i'm 100 percent behind that and i think i think that's a lot of it a lot of that is because boxing doesn't have the same well for one we don't have like one organization overseeing so it's kind of like everyone oh, yeah. anyone can make it even even like today a lot of the professional boxers or or, or let's just say in boxing in general there seems to be this thing to take the shortcut and, and there's a, there's a quicker way to get there. And it's about building the body beautiful. And it's, excuse me, it's not about honing the skills anymore. And it's just like, it's, um, I don't want to say it's just like a, a money grab because the fighters are willing to pay what to do whatever they have to do to get there. But there's other people saying, okay, this is the money I invested. I need to get you there safely, and I need to get you there so you're marketed and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So, so they're doing things, you know, um, they're doing things that isn't going to lead to a long career as a professional boxer. And if you if you face um, somebody now, there are a few fighters obviously that 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 are about skills and that are about, um, you know, I'll take Canelo, for instance, like when he fought, take a look at him when he fought Mayweather, he lost, he lost to Mayweather and he was beaten soundly. And he comes back later and he comes in, he works on his skills and he hones his skills. He learned from that. He's more, now he's, he's, you know, he moves his head really nice. He makes opponents miss and he counters and it's, you know, boxing one on one and it's beautiful to see. He's one of those there's a few of those guys like Crawford and and uh and, and himself that that stick out and that are really good fighters and they could fight in any generation. But generally um you just don't have the same level of of, of uh of fighters today as you did in let's say the nineties and the eighties.
in the 70s and so forth and back on. And maybe the 60s say that about the 80s. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, it, it was a harder road to get there back then than it was in my day. And it's easier to get there today than it was in my day as well. So I guess it's all relative, but um, you still, you know, there is, it's unfortunate what, what's happening with boxing and the shortcut is only going to get us a kick in the butt and we have to somehow bring it back to realness. You know what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise boxing is not going to be able to uh, withstand the competition that's coming in. You're not going to be able to win. And, and that's another thing. And I love what you're doing is because you're dealing more with the skill side and the insight to boxing. And that's what needs to be made attractive to people. People don't understand generally what it takes to make an opponent, to make a guy who's punching at you miss. Like to stand this much in front of a person, it's like a magic trick, you know what I mean? To stand two feet away from a person and to make this guy miss 10 punches in a row, I mean, that's insane. You'd yeah. never be able to do that unless you've been hit in the face a number of times to hone that ability to be able to make a miss. And, and that's never talked about. None of the announcers on TV talk about it. They don't talk about like that energy those two fighters are, are exchanging in the middle of a fight. And, and, they, and they don't see the nuances that are happening in the ring. And only a trained eye is gonna see that. People that have been in the ring and, and allow the fighters who are at ringside commentating with you, allow them to state that. And don't just keep it topical because that's what you understand. It's like learn something, you know what I mean? Like someone like Howard Cosell, I thought he was one of the greatest announcers of all time because he didn't. He talked about the entertainment aspect of it. He talked about the energy of it, but he wasn't talking about the intricacies of it. That's something that needs to be talked about: the intricacies of it and what, and and like that again, like how those energies are exchanging. How you can see one fighter come out strong in this round, and all of a sudden that energy has changed, and something happened that you didn't see. Besides an overhand right to the chin or whatever it is that's allowing that that fight to all of a sudden change direction yeah something happened to make that fight change direction something happened with tyson um uh fury that made this second fight so much different because look the last time he ended up you know he, he ended up he was on his back that first fight and uh and he was and and he came back but you know what I mean? There, there would be, uh, there's a lot of, uh, to many people, there's a lot of doubt going into the next fight because, hey, this guy, he dropped me. And now, now I'm thinking to myself, if I were, if I were, if I were, um, punchy again, <laughs> sorry, um, if I were wilder, I would be thinking, all I got to do is hit him. All I got to do is hit him again, and that's going to be it. So I'm going to let my hands go as best I can. But that wasn't the case. That dynamic absolutely changed. What was it that changed that fight? And that's not discussed. And no. that's crazy. Because, you know, those kinds of things are what make, like, it, it, it kind of, like, it would make, it would draw more people into it. Because it's so human. To be able to, like, for Tyson to be able to beat somebody who had him on his back and almost a 10 count, for him to be able to come back and so confidently step in that ring and just like do a, yeah. do a number on his opponent, that's huge. Yeah. For a, for a fighter to come back in a rematch and to fight a guy who would knock you out and beat him, that's incredible. That really, yeah. that's just incredible. Oh, it's, a, it's an incredible. I mean, so much credit goes to Fury and Wilder really for creating those moments because it brought back boxing back in a lot of ways because it had that iconic moment of fury getting up off the deck and you know if they hadn't taken that fight we wouldn't have got that and there's so much fire around the heavyweight division now but you're so right and i look about look at that moment um i could be reading too far into it i'm kind of doing a little bit of a promotion right now but really when you look at fury and the way he rose up off the deck in the 12th round against wilder after everything he went through was really kind of the moment where i said Fury will always have that mental advantage over Wilder now. And I don't think Wilder will ever be able to beat him kind of after that moment, because that was really when Fury was at his weakest and he was still able to take what Wilder gave him and get up like no one had done before. And then in their match, um, to be able to close the distance and then walk Wilder down exactly like he said he was going to do in the press yeah, conference. Yeah. No one believed him. I didn't believe him. And he did it. <laughs> 
And it was like the bravery, <laughs> the, the, the drama of it all. It's like, these are the moments that boxing needs in like to do it in the heavyweight division. That's just the cherry on top. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The big men need to, you know, um, the, the middleweights, like the welterweights, middleweights, the super middleweights, or light heavyweights, they're usually the backbone, the spine of boxing, and the heavyweights are the head. That's the shine, you know what I mean? That's the crown. And But when, when heavyweights do well, everyone eats, you know what I mean? So um, so it, it's great if boxing can get, if, if heavyweight boxing can get back to the day of um, like Tyson, Holyfield, uh, you know, you even had David, like your top 10, you have David Tua, number 10. That's crazy. That's a super talented guy. But you have, you know, Ike Bayabuchi, you have, you have, uh, you know, like I said, Holyfield, Tyson, uh, Lennox Lewis. I mean, this is incredible talent, incredible talent. And we haven't seen that kind of talent, I guess, since then, really. Um, right. You know, it's guys with like an amazing amateur pedigree. Um, with with real fight skill and fight knowledge and and their knowledge comes from tried and true practice in the gym it isn't about hitting the weights and you know creating the body beautiful which i think they kind of did um over in england with uh joshua and that was why he had problems the problems he had with uh andy ruiz um what happens with a lot of guys when they get trained and especially with heavyweights over in england they like to make them you know big and muscular to give him that King Kong effect. Like he can't be beat yeah. by anybody. Look at my muscles. Instead of focusing on the skills of a fighter. And and that's what's going to get through. So in the second fight with Andy Ruiz, he took a more skillful path. He didn't engage as much. It was obviously a smarter fight and he won that fight. And he, and he could have done the same thing earlier um, and right away without the pain. But um, everyone has got to learn their way. They've got to learn, I guess. Yeah. I, I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, Joshua, um, his second his second fight with Ruiz, I was a little, uh, dis I, I don't know if I should say disappointed, but yeah. I mean, as a fan, I wanted him to kind of go get that back, you know, go get that yeah. get that win back. And I feel like he did just enough and, and just stayed safe. And he put on a great performance. He did everything he was supposed to do to get his belts back. Mm -hmm. But it's just like I wanted that extra, yeah. you know, that extra push to really like say, you know, that that was a fluke and like, I'm the guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. And, and that's one of the most interesting things about boxing. Like you see how it changed from, uh, you know, there were certain fighters who had certain fight attitudes and they kind of influenced boxing a certain way. Like, like you look at Ali and after Ali hit his fame, a lot of people tried to emulate his style with Sugar Ray Leonard or Tommy Hearns. A lot of people tried to emulate his style with uh, Floyd Mayweather, for instance. A lot of people began to emulate his style with the shoulder roll and the whole, you know what I mean? And and, and everyone all of a sudden was doing this. You know what I mean? It's like that had been around, that had been around forever. But you know what I mean? It's like all of a sudden that was popular. And um, um, I just think like, the, what the, Sugar Ray Leonard and Oscar De La Hoya, much, much respect. Obviously, super, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard is one of the greatest fighters of all time. But when he started to win the fight by, you know, moving around, moving around, moving around strategically, like what he did with Hagler, and then at the last 30 seconds of the round, throw a flurry to cement the round, that signaled to a lot of fighters, that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to take the easy way. I'm going to take a careful way out, not the easy way out. After all, he was a welterweight fighting Marvin Hagler, who's a beast and, and just a killer. So you're not going to stand in front of him. So he adapted and fought the best strategy he, he could fight to win that, to win that fight. But then you have other fighters um, that start to do it. And one was like, like Oscar De La Hoya and there were a couple of other fighters to do it. They started to like just box, use their range, use their range. And then throw like hard for the last 15, 20 seconds of the fight and uh, of the round and try to win the round. And they would steal the rounds and that would help them cement the fight. Um, and that that came to a head, I think, with the Trinidad fight against De La Hoya. And instead of giving the round to Oscar De La Hoya for, you know, squeaking out the last 30 seconds, they gave it to, um, they gave it to Trinidad because De La Hoya didn't engage for two minutes and 30 seconds of the round. Right. Kind of thing. You know, I, I'm saying that generally. It wasn't in every round, but in, in a lot of the rounds, they gave those rounds to Trinidad instead. And rightfully, De La Hoya did technically win that fight, 
but they gave it to Trinidad, I believe, based solely on that. And um, that's the thing with boxing, that, um, you know, to get back to that, being able to fight for a good solid three minutes, like, that's what it's that's what's missing today it's like there's a lot of time being taken off there's a lot of like smoke and mirrors and not like the intent of boxing is to like here's here, in my mind here's the intent of boxing round one starts the fight schedule for 15 rounds i have 15 rounds to knock you out not i have 15 rounds to win the fight you're not supposed to go the distance with me if you go the distance with me technically I'm supposed to get the decision. That's your thinking as the fighter. That's your mentality as the fighter. Yeah. That, at least that was the old school. That's not the same mentality today. The same mentality is, um, I mean, the, the mentality today is, is like, yeah, is, it, it isn't about stop. That guy should not go the distance with me. That isn't the intent of the fighter anymore. It's fine. I'm going to do what I can to win the fight. And if it's 10 rounds or 15 rounds and I have to go the distance, I'm going to do that. And I'm gonna fight safely and until until you know, but if but if you were to turn it around like Marvin Hagler used to be like, "Lay, if you can't go the distance with me, man, you ain't going." But I'm going in there to take your head off. And Tommy Hearns is the same way. And Mike Tyson was the same way. Evander Holyfield was the same way. James Tony, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, Sonny Liston, everybody that ever fought that was Rocky Marciano, Alexis Arguello, Aaron Pryor. All those great fighters were about. If you cannot, if you don't have the skills to go the distance with me, you're going out. That's it. And that's the way boxing should be in my book. It's like, that, that's the goal. That's when, you know what I mean? So I'm going to set that, I'm going to set my pace. I'm going to throw my punch. I'm going to bring that heat. And if you can handle that, then all well and good. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. That's, that's the way boxing should be in my book. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. And, and that's why I was glad, or, you know, I was happy to see that Fury was just, for real when he said that he was going to come forward and push the pace and look for the knockout he wasn't just talking he really wanted to uh make that statement so you know there's a guy that's that's kind of doing it he's doing that old school and uh i'm looking forward to whatever's next for him whether it's a wilder fight again or if he skips that and goes to joshua i'd like to see if he uh tries to look for the finish in that too as well um the, the whole um it's like I don't know, the heavyweight division seems like it's post-apocalyptic to me. Like, it's just been devastated and it doesn't seem like there's been... Ever since, like, I don't know, Tyson Holyfield, Lewis, um, maybe even, like, uh, Vitaly Klitschko. During the Klitschko the era, it was pretty... The thing with the Klitschko is how dominant... They were so dominant, but they weren't an attraction. So it really kind of died a little bit. The, the, their style, yeah, their style kind of died. Uh, kind of killed the sport because well Vitali would be more yeah, good, good. A bit. but uh, yeah but um, but uh, um, his brother who reigned for a long time right. uh, was very careful in the way he approached his fights you know and um, I, I think that kind of um, took a lot of the, the the luster from that from that heavyweight thing and, um, and then it just came about you know if you have a number of fights and you win those fights, you're getting money, you're getting paid. The, the, the thing is now is about not losing. It's not about winning. It's about not losing. And that's, and that kind of, that kind of dull on the sport, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, there's so much to be said on the boxing scene right now, but it's like, we do have stars. We've got Canelo, we got Tyson Fury, Wilder, Joshua, um, you know, Pac-Man is still in the mix, which I love. And uh, I'm curious to see what's next for him, but to move away. I really love Crawford. I really love Crawford. He's, he's, Crawford. he's got, yeah, he's got really beautiful skills and, and his temper. I like the way he, like he shifted up in his last fight. He was like, okay, this isn't going to work. Let me try this. And, and you just see him mentally switch gears. That's something that only elite fighters can do. And that's, that was really cool. I, I love seeing that. It, it isn't dead. Yeah, he's another great guy. Um, but what, what are you up to with uh, aerospace? I know um, yeah. it seems like a tremendous facility um, yeah. in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, I'd be curious to hear more about that. Yeah. Well, aerospace is... I mean, we're, we were the first ones to do, and it was interesting because my partner, her name was Leila Fazel, and she worked with Ian Schrager. And Ian Schrager was the first one, he, he just, he's from Studio 54, if you remember that place. He owned Studio 54, Ian Schrager, and Steve Rubel. <laughs> Before my time, but I've heard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's legend, right? It was before uh, I was born then, but I was before. <laughs> I couldn't go there. I wouldn't get in. Yeah. But, um, but um, he also started the first boutique hotels. So, um, you know, those, you, when you go down, to, uh, when you come to, you see these really expensive boutique, small, personal kind of like hotels. He was the first one to do that and popularize it. And, um, and so uh, my partner, uh, before she was my partner, she was my student. Layla um, asked me if I, you know, I said I wanted to do a gym. She said she didn't choose me to Ian. It wasn't quite right to, for Ian because boxing at that time in a, in a hotel, they were just like, I don't get it. So I understood that. Um, so we formed a partnership and we opened up aerospace in the meatpacking district of New York back when it was the meatpacking district still. So it was kind of crazy down there, but it was beautiful. The gym, I mean, yes, Adriana Lima, Doubts and Cross. We had the Victoria's Secret models. We had um, 50 Cent. We had, you know, who's who of, of like in music. Beyonce, Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg. Um, uh, Josh Hartnett, um, oh, oh man, you just, uh, they'll just, they'll. Hemsworth, I believe I saw as well, one of the Hemsworth brothers maybe, or I don't know, the list goes on. I, watched, I, I worked with him recently, yeah, Chris Hemsworth, Thor. Yeah, so he's got so a you're, great You're doing a lot of the fight court choreography for films and. So I do fight choreography for films and I get guys uh, trained, um, Yes, for film, getting ready for role. So it's either to get them in shape for a role or if they're doing a boxing role. I worked on Ali with um, Will Smith and Michael Mann and, and that was an amazing, that was an amazing journey. Um, so so um, it, it's been, it's been really an interesting, an interesting life, like post actual competitive boxing. Yeah. Uh, Boy, being on stage, there's recently there's a young lady I work with and she's playing Tina Turner on Broadway. And it's just amazing. Broadway's closed right now, but it's just amazing how she moves. And she used boxing and that energy to give herself more energy for this part. Because wow. as you know, if you ever seen Tina Turner perform, she's just, you know, she's just on another level. So this young lady just turned it up and turned it out. And, and anyone who wants to see, um, I guess, the other side of what boxing can do for your conditioning, I guess you've got to yeah. get down to the Tina Turner show. So, so in aerospace, you know, outside of um, training actors or, or, you know, celebrities or whoever, um, really to get in shape for roles or, um, you know, a fashion show and um, et cetera, really. But... Um, the gym itself at aerospace, are you, what's the land? Like, take me inside of aerospace. Cause I, I've, I've checked out the website and I see there's rings in there. There's bags. Like what's the, what is the, um, is it, is it meant to be for fitness or is there, are there fighters coming through as well or. Okay. So, um, we've had a lot of fighters come through and visit and some train, uh, train there as well. And that's been kind of cool before their fights in New York city, but basically it is about fitness. So the ring is smaller. The ring um, I should say the ring was because aerospace is closed now and not only because of uh, COVID, but we decided to close it because as partners, we decided to go different directions with it. So, so the gym itself, aerospace is closed, but something's coming behind it and yeah. it's really cool. So the boxing methodology, our aero methodology is still intact. But um, so you went into the gym and it was incredibly beautiful. Like as a box, as boxing gym goes, as boxing gyms go, there was nothing like it. I mean, it was clean. It was immaculate. Music sound had a boxing ring for people that wanted to actually get in and compete, um, or or spar. Um, we had group fitness classes uh, on the top floor, uh, like with jump rope and shadow boxing and sculpting and doing things that a fighter would do to get in shape. It was all boxing oriented, right? Um, it had this great door that used to, you'd hit a button, the door would open it up, and it would attach spaces, and it was just ahead of its time. So as a, as a, as a boxing club before any of the boutique boxing clubs you see now, we were the first and it was amazing. They all came to aerospace and saw it and then went back and did another thing. It was so cool. And so but then you, you went downstairs to the second level, that's where our impact class was. And we had showers and lockers. And again, it was immaculate down there. Sprung wood floor that was easy, great for you to jump rope on. We had heavy bags and in this room, we had like maybe I would say 16 heavy, uh, 12 heavy bags and double end bags and speed bags. 
and we put two people on the unit, it would be packed. We'd have like 25 to 30 people in the impact class. And we'd have them throwing combinations like a real boxer. And it was just, it was just mind blowing. Like it was the kind of thing people hungered for, you know what I mean? Something real. Right. And it was so much fun. And men, women, all ages, didn't matter what it was. It was just, it was kind of like the, the holy grail for fitness boxing. It really was a great place. And so we're open from, um, see 2004, to 2019 so you had a really good long run it was great but great. now you know we got to start to like do a little bit more global is there a uh, a sneak peek or any info that you could give us for what's next for aerospace well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> aerospace is kind of like really it's like it's it's like a Arrow is kind of like a methodology, and and what what I like to think of is like if someone were to take someone off, someone came to me and said I want to learn boxing and I want to learn boxing for bit fitness and I want to learn boxing as a profession, you wouldn't teach them any different, with the exception of the getting hit part, right? So I, I'm about like get fit without getting hit for people that don't want to do that, for but for people that do want to compete. You still need to learn the skills, and I, and the skills I ask of people who have never boxed before is the same skill that I would ask of a fighter. There's no reason why you can't hook off a jab like a professional fighter. Why not? Absolutely, why not? You know what I mean? <laughs> There's no reason why not. You and you're not going to make a mistake and get hit either. But I, I asked, I asked people to execute at a fighter's pace, at a fighter's level, with the same amount of endurance, with the same amount of, of pop and vigor and intent on your punches as a professional athlete. That way you're getting 100% the benefits. The, I, I'm kind of like, the best thing we can do in life, uh, like to be fit, do what an athlete does. If you yeah. do what an athlete does, you're at the epitome of what your body is going to be. and and no one's in better shape in the world than an athlete right a professional athlete and boxers are some of the the higher echelon type athletes that everyone could benefit from like if you get the benefit of a, the resting heart rate of a boxer who's fighting 15 or 12 rounds or whatever you're doing pretty good <laughs> yeah. you pretty much do a, you could do a whole lot of things without you know what i mean right, like right. having a heart attack um so that's all about giving the benefits of a boxer and keep it real and do real things. Like, you know what I mean? And that's kind of what, um, that's been my credo. And that's what I want to bring to people, but I want to bring to people more than in just like in one gym. It, I, I don't think it can be done. I think knowledge, the knowledge has to be dispersed differently. So I look at the internet and I'm thinking to myself, well, why not build out that ability online? Why not? Um, why not? because people can learn in their house. And this exact thing, the COVID-19 um, has taught me that people have the willingness to learn in their home and they can, it can be done. Right. And, and, um, and so that's, everything's sort of like being synchronous right now. It's led me to the right, right place at the right time. And this is where I feel I need, to, what I need to do right now, take knowledge, Put it online where people can understand it and see it and practice it in the comfort of their own home. No one's looking at them. People feel like they're judged when they're in a crowd. You know, one of the interesting things about fitness boxing is it's probably 60 to 70 percent female. If any of us need cardiovascular fitness and if any of us should be boxing for fitness, it's men. Probably 30 percent of the men go for boxing for fitness. Why? Maybe they think. You know, a lot of the trainers aren't, maybe they understand, maybe they think they're not real and I'm not going to box with them because they're teaching fitness boxing and it's not real boxing. I'm not going to learn the real thing. So I'm just going to go over the weights and continue to do what I do. I'm going to pump and I'm going to do my, my um, bench press and I'm going to do my squats and I'm going to walk around and I'm like, huh, and I'm, but that's really not what fitness is all about. What it's, what it is about is mentally like challenging yourself. Yep. And, but more than anything, it's the engine. It's not the body. It's not about having big muscles and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Guess what? It's the engine. You need to be able to like get from here to there without getting tired. Once you get tired, like in real life, it's like in a fight. You can have all the skills and ability. You can punch like the devil. You can have the you can be the greatest puncher in the world. Once you get tired, that leaves you. 
And what are you going to do then, right? So it's about the engine. If your engine's good, you can withstand anything in this world. Anything. As long as you don't get tired, you don't give up on yourself. Hey, you're golden. You can outlast anybody else. Let them get tired before you do, and you'll reap the rewards. So, and that's what, that's what cardiovascular based boxing, uh, muscle, cardiovascular based muscle endurance can do for you. And yeah. To you, you know what I mean? So, I, so, I, so I think like we have, there's still some work to be done there, and that's what I'm exploring right now, and it feels really good. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing more of that once you guys continue to develop. And, um, you know, is there any guys or any, any one you've trained in the past, whether it's an actor or, you know, whoever really, that really surprised you in terms of their engine, as you mentioned, or their ability as a boxer? Yes. Hugh Jackman. <laughs> Hugh Jackman was crazy. Like his, his coordination and his recall, like it was just on another planet. It really, really, really was. So he was the Wolverine for real. The Wolverine, like, yeah, if he hit <laughs> <you>, no. <laughs> um, uh, of course, um, um, I, I worked with Jake Gyllenhaal, and he had a lot of fire, a lot of desire, you know what I mean? And and so his work ethic was great. I worked with, you know, Mark Wahlberg, he'd done some boxing already, so I can't lay claim to that, but he was great. Um, Josh Hartnett had, like, a wicked right hand, and just, like, he had hell in that right hand. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he was just a good natural punch. He had a chance for his weight into the punch. And, you know, he was respectable. As a fighter, if you got hit by it, you'd re definitely respect him. Um, that's, um, that's high praise for him. I'm yeah, sure you would appreciate that. Yeah, I worked with a lot of guys. Um, uh, Will Smith, very talented, extremely coordinated and, and very gifted. And um, he worked with a lot of, uh, a lot of good boxing people to you know get to play the role of ali um extremely talented who is it um um oh my god there's there's no one he played chuck in uh the chuck webner story that recently came out um Liev, uh, great uh, i know who you're talking about great Liev shriver i'm sorry Liev shriver um he played the, he played uh saber tooth in the wolverine movie and he also played chuck chuck webner in the recent movie that was on uh, Chuck Wepner. based off of that, the story of Chuck Wepner. Yeah, yeah. And, and Liev did an incredible job getting that, getting that part done. He took punches. He, you know, he, um, and, and his ability is like, he's no slouch. He's, he, he, these people that I'm talking about, if they would have been redirected and not went the way of acting and went the way of they have the kind of coordination and the ingredients it takes to be a competitive athlete. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, well, they, weren't getting, cool. they weren't getting flustered when they were get if they got hit by accident. Who knows what happens when you're really in it for real? I don't know. But all I know is like when they got hit, when they got hit or touched or when it got uncomfortable, they weren't looking to back out and take another way. You know what I mean? That's cool they to hear from about Schreiber because, of course, you know his voice on uh, HBO's 24 seven is, is kind of iconic for, for boxing fans. Oh, yeah. it's recognizable. Um, so many of Floyd's uh, 24 seven episodes are narrated by him. It's like a voice that will always be around um, due yeah. to attachment with Floyd. Yeah. He's got a great voice for that. And, and he, and he loves the sport and he's actually been practicing it for a long time. So um, he gets in there and he spars with his boys and, you know, he has, he has a good time. He's, 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 uh, he's really good. That's awesome. Well, Michael, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for the time today. It was uh, really fun speaking with you about your career and what you got going on with aerospace and just everything, man. I really appreciate it. It was a, it was a great, fun interview for me. So um, I, I'd love for you to tell everyone, you know, where to follow you on, on social media and, and what you got going on. Okay, well, um, basically, my my tag on social media is the at sign El Cuerpo de Papi. So if you speak Spanish, no problem. If you do not, it's E L C U E R P O D E P A P I. I don't know if you got that. Rewind it if you don't. But El Cuerpo de Papi, or you can just look at my name, Michael Olajide Jr. It's yeah. on Twitter, and I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. And love to have you come through and try classes with us. I do online classes, and I got to get you in a class, right? Oh, most definitely. I'm I'm 100% in. Once uh 
things get back to normal here or online. I'm down yeah, for online. online. Let's do it. I'm going to drop you a line. So this week, we need to get some footage of you doing it. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Just let me know. I'm 100% in. So okay. much. Cool. And everyone listening and watching, please uh, subscribe to the Pod Matrix on YouTube. That's where these episodes come out. Follow me at Brooklyn Boxing Podcast on Instagram and Twitter. Can't wait for this episode to drop. Uh, Michael, thanks again. I'll be sure to send this your way as Thank soon you. as it is out. I got to say congratulations. You're doing something that's, that boxing needs. And um, it's beautiful to see like somebody young as yourself with that passion for it. Like, generally with boxing, it's always like the older guys that have gone through it or they're kind of tired of it, but it's their job, you know, it pays them or it's their employment or whatever it is. But to see somebody so, so... Um, hungry for it and, and, and somebody of youth with passion for it and willing to go in there and spar to like understand what they're talking about even more and to go back into the history of it, it's rare. And so um, I look forward to you being the voice, uh, a strong voice in boxing for a long time because we do need it. Well, I appreciate that, man. That means the world. So thanks so much again. And, and uh, I can't thank you enough. I'll send this right to you when it's out. Right. <laughs>